honestly, it's not easy to sleep with different men or about 15 men a day sober. It, it's not okay. Like, really? It's 15 men a day. Like, sometimes it's used to be more than that, more than 15 men a day. Because at the core of who we are as humans is that we're all knitted by our stories, by our journeys, and by the things we've gone through, even though they're not the same. But at the core of it, we're human, we're all about love, we're all about just living a stable life, living a life that has peace. But for you, Sis Emma, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, you've, you've gone through many situations that uh, are unfavorable. Some of them were caused by you. And some of the things that you, the decisions that you took, Thanks. some of them are things that happened to you because of the circumstances that you found yourself in. Some of the things are actually things that were done to you by people you love who meant a lot to you. But today you're going to take us to that story so that at, by the end of this, the person who's consuming this conversation gets to learn and reflect on their own life. So welcome to Engineer Your Life. Oh. Um, my name is Lulia and KM. And really, thank you so much for, for trusting us with the story that you're, you're about to share today. How are you? How's your heart? No, I'm okay. I'm in peace. Because that's what I love to do. Like, you know, bringing hope to the lost. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you, you, you haven't always been at peace. Uh, can I say, after finding Jesus, actually, I'm yeah. in a lot of peace. Yeah. 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 Uh, we'll get there. But I want us to start at the very beginning. Um. Emma Pole is your full name. Oh, yes. uh, where does it start? Uh, is it a small town? Is it a rural area? Which province? I'm assuming you're South African. Um, wh where did the story start? Where is where is Emma Pole born? Okay, I was born in Tumaula Paris in Free State. Um, I grew up in a very dysfunctional family, whereby my mom was there, but she was not there. Basically, my mom was a prostitute and alcoholic. So I was raised by my own uncle who was disabled. And um, my uncle's wife was not treating me well. Like he, she was, yeah, she was not okay. So my mom used to come and go, come and go, come and go. Like I'll see my mom in a year or two, so, you know. And like she will come take me from school and literally go and just dump me somewhere else to the friend's place and stuff like that. So uh, I've seen a lot and heard a lot as a child. Uh, for example, my mom, as I said, my mom was a prostitute. So I started knowing sex at the age of four, whereby my mom was sleeping with men in front of me at that young age. So from... How does it get... I, I'm not trying to interrupt you, but I want us to do it in a chronological way where we go from age to age and build it up to where you are now. At the age of four, when do you realize that this is sex that my mother is doing? Are you able to recognize that? Or it's also just this... You know, it was confusing at that moment because I didn't actually know what was dead. But then when I was in grade one, maybe I was like six, five years old, somewhere there, then that's when I started like knowing that actually this is sex, that what my mom was doing before in front of me at that age. So, um, and then from there, uh, when I was seven, my mom tried to take my life. So... Um, my uncle helped me, so she left. So they moved me from uh, Free State to Val to stay with my aunt, aunt there because, as I said, my uncle was disabled. So my mom was taking advantage of that, that he can't fight back, he can't stand up and fight for me. So they took me to my aunt, whereby my mom was scared of my aunt, so she wouldn't come there. Until um, I was nine years old, and then my mom was in hospital, in um, hospice. So we didn't even know where she was for almost two years. She disappeared. No one knew where she was. So they found out she's in Bosbeck in hospice hospital. She was diagnosed with HIV. That was 2002. And then she passed away on the 9th of November. So 
when she passed that time, like, at that moment, it's like, I knew she will never come back again. So, like, I was at peace that she's gone now and forever. So it didn't actually bother me that much. You were at peace that the lady who has caused you so much trauma is actually gone. You, you understand? So, so no, in that at that moment I was in peace actually. Yeah. But then when I grew up, it actually affected me some way. You understand? So at the age of fourteen, I started being naughty. You know. Before we get there, I want us to go between age four to seven, where you say um, uh, you're living with your uncle and you're witnessing sex. Just yeah. just take me through what what's happening. Like, do men come to your house? Is it rich men? Is it normal men? Like, I, I actually want those, those that, 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 that process. So, um, at that age four, I was staying with my mom. She was renting somewhere else in Hammerscrow. So, they, my mom, as I said, my mom was a prostitute and alcoholic. So, it used to come different men every day. And, you know, as a child growing up, see a man, a male figure, you get hip and then they bring you sweets and stuff like that. Then you be like, my daddy, my new daddy. Every time it's a new daddy coming. So... But then there was other ones that they were not good, actually, because they will touch me, like, in my private parts and stuff like that at that small age. But at that moment, I didn't understand what was going on, you know. So my mom got sick in that, like, when I think I was five, my mom got sick. So she had to take me back to my uncle. Actually, the neighbors did because she was so sick that she couldn't walk. So they took me back to Paris. So that's when I was at Paris until six, seven, and then she came. And then that's when she tried to kill me at the age of seven years. Then I survived. And then, yeah. How did she try to kill you? What? Uh, she tried to stab me with a knife. She had a knife. She used to go with this pocket knife. My mom was mad. All I can say, my mom was not okay. I feel like she was, she was mental disturbed or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But she was in... My mom used to fight with me. And she used to be a bully. She, she, like, I don't know, like, what I can say, but... She she was not okay. She tried to stab you or she stabbed you and it didn't work? No, she tried to stab me on my neck. Okay. And so my aunt came in that time. So they stopped, they pulled the knife from her. Okay. And she's like, no, I'm going to die. So she, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave her in this world. He, stuff like that, you know? So, yeah. And then they chased her out in the house. You moved back to your uncle's place? <laughs> at that age yeah. when she got sick when I was five okay. I moved to my uncle yeah. and she came when I was seven by my uncle so two years later she's she just disappeared like that yeah. yes and she came back to your uncle now you're seven what's happening why is she back what what's I don't know because I don't know that as I said she was there but she was not there I had a mom but she she was not I don't know like I don't know my mom yeah. if you can ask me something now like about what my mom loves I wouldn't tell you what was my mom's favorite color I don't know I don't know, hey, I just know they say this person is the one that gave birth to me as a mother, but I don't know nothing about my mom. The only things or the memories that I have about my mom, it's only bad things, bad things that she did to me, things that she taught me or she, she made me see at that young age. That's the only things that I, the memories that I have of my mom, nothing else. Do you remember um, exactly what these different men would do to you outside of her. I mean, you're saying she was having sex with them. Um, she was fighting them sometimes. But what did they do to you? Because obviously they were in your proximity, in your presence. So like I said, about, I think about three or four of them, they, like one tried to rape me, but she fought with him. So she stopped him. There she protected me. She fought with the guy and then the guy left. So that's when she became sick after it. So three of them about to try to like, they were touching me on my private parts, you know, telling me that I'm a good girl. And then the other ones don't make me to play with their, uh, their penis. So, yeah. Okay, she, she passes on. Does she pass on in the hospice or where does she pass away? So what happened, I was coming back from school. This time I'm about eight years old. So I'm coming back from school. My aunt is telling me that uh, they found my mom, but she's not in a good condition. I was like, okay. So they said, like, okay, I think it was, like, let's say Thursday. And then they said, Sunday, we go into hospice to see her. I was like, okay. And then Sunday came, we went there. And when we arrived at hospice, yo, I couldn't recognize my mom anymore. Like, I didn't know the person that was in front of me that time. And in, 
imagine I'm only eight years old. My own grandmother as well, they didn't even recognize her, the way she was so sick, thin, black. I don't know, you could even see the bones on her face, though, how sickness did to her. Because, you know, those times there wasn't cure for HIV and stuff like that. So it, at that moment, she was already in AIDS. She was bl- full-blown. She was, yo, like, yeah. There was no treatment to manage the You know, so we couldn't recognize her. And when she was coming on the on the aisle like that, my grand was like, no, man, that's not Maria. And she responded with her own voice. She's like, no, it's me. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't even recognize it at all. So we sat there, and then we just, like, you know, they were talking. And then she looked at my aunt. She's like, uh, please take care of her. You know, that's what she said. Yes, yeah. that's what she said to my aunt. And then, fine, we went back home. It was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. When I come back from school, my aunt sit me down. She's like, okay, um, you know when you're a child, she's like, what happened if the person dies, you know? And I'm like, uh, accidents, sickness, stuff like that. You know, I mentioned a few things, you know? She's like, okay, your mom passed away this morning. We got a call. I cried that moment only. And then after that, we went to Paris to bury him and stuff like that. But at the funeral, I didn't cry. I don't know why. They, they, I don't know. As I said, there was so much peace in me knowing, okay, now this person is not coming back. Especially when I saw that coffin going down. I'm like, okay, this is, this is, this is finished. The pain is finished. The, the torture, whatsoever, things that I experienced, it's finished. Yes, yes. Not knowing, Hori, these things... It, it's 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 a bloodline case, you know. No one broke it in the family. My mom passed; she didn't broke it, so it passed to me, not knowing that time. So yeah, fine. From there, after the funeral, um, okay, I had a dad. I have a dad. He's still alive, but my dad also wasn't. He wasn't there. Yes, he wasn't present. I think since in my life, I saw my dad twice, when I was two years old, and after my mom passed. My mom passed 2009. My, my dad appeared 2010. Uh, my mom passed 2003. Two, sorry. My mom passed 2002. My dad appeared 2003. Appeared. Yes. So you seen him I, since I was two years old. Only when your mother passed, your, your dad appeared. Appeared. From where no one knows. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, my dad came. My dad came and he was like, but like, because of my uncle played this big role in my life of being a father, you know, and a mother at the same time. So that thing of dead, like I didn't know what was that. I didn't know my dad. I didn't even care, you know. So he came and he was there and then he left again. He left. When he left, yeah, fine. I was still going to school, doing well, you know, stuff like that. At the age of 14, things started being like, very not okay. I started being naughty, dodging school, going out and drink, sleeping around, mm. all those things, you know. So my uncle tried to speak to me. They tried to take me to boarding school, thinking that maybe if I move to such environments, going to boarding school, yeah. I'll do well. Because I would grow up as a, I was very intelligent when I grew up. Like I was very smart, you know. So... Yeah, and then when they applied, they applied uh, this school, a uh, opera school, the one for girls. Yes, they did apply then, and I was accepted. So, but for me, knowing where I'm going, I was so scared, and I'm like, my family now is abandoning me, you know? Then I started running away from home. My mom abandoned me and passed away. Yes. My dad appeared and abandoned me. Yes. Now my family in totality is trying to abandon me. You know? I think that's what's going on through this. Yes. You know, neglection. You know, all those lies that the devil's put in our heads. And so, because of we grew up with those lies since we were small, after the things that we experienced, you know? So now you're saying, okay, my mom doesn't want me. My dad didn't want me. Mm-hmm. Now my family doesn't want me as well. You know? I'm like, no way. So now I'm going to live my own life. So I started running away from home. 
oh, before that, so while I was still at home starting being notes, stuff like that, my uncle tried to speak to me, called my family, they set me down. And before the boarding school thing, I tried to commit suicide at that age 14, uh, whereby I remember coming back from the, like wherever where I slept to a guy place, came back the following day in the morning. And then when I reached home, my uncle's like, no, we can't have you anymore in the house because you don't want to listen to anyone. You want to be a woman? Go be a woman outside, not in this house. You understand? So at that moment, I opened cheek and I drank the bottle of cheek, almost like an entire bottle. And then it just closed my of my breathing pipe and stuff like that. So they had to call the ambulance and I went to the hospital. That was my first attempt of trying to commit suicide. Fine, I came back, they forgave me, then tried to go back to school again. Then that time school was boring and, you know, didn't enjoy it anymore. Then started smoking weed from school, doing all those funny stuff. Then at the age 15, I dropped out. I'm like, nah, not going back to school anymore. So my uncle chased me out in the house. So at that moment, I met girls whereby they already, uh, they were already prostituting themselves. And it was like all the girls, you know, my friends. So when we were there, they taught me, they're like, you know what, there's a, uh, uh, easy way to survive. Leave your family. You can make it. We'll teach you how to, you know. So that's when I was introduced to uh, prostitution at the age of 15 years. What area is this? In Sriena King. There's a, I don't know if I must call it by name, but there's a place that used to be called, before it used to be called Central Hotel, but now it's called Manhattan. So we went there and then they, they were working there. So what happened in there basically is that you own the room and then you just pay, let's say, 150 for a day. Then the rest of the money is yours. You can do whatever you want with it. So I said, I was like, cool, why not? It's money, you know, because making a lot of money, just paying 150 is nothing. So I just went and stayed there. Life was good at that moment. I felt like life was good. I was enjoying myself. No one is there telling me what to do. No one is controlling me. No one is abandoning me. Like I was just enjoying myself. But the things that I was drinking like almost every day, because honestly, it's not easy to sleep with different men or about 15 men a day sober. It, it's not okay. Like really? 15 men a day. Sometimes it's, it's sometimes it's used to be more than that, more than fifteen minutes a day. So, at the age of sixteen, I fell pregnant, and then I tried to contact home because, like, I left home for about three years without talking to anyone. So I tried to call home, call my granny because I knew her numbers by head and my uncles. So I called her. Her phone was going on, and I dropped the phone. I was scared to talk at that moment, and then she called back. And then suddenly I answered. I'm like, hey, it's me. Um, I'm not okay. I just want to come back home, stuff like that. She's like, where have you been? We've been looking for you. You just disappeared. You're not saying anything. I'm like, Ugh, it's a long story. I will tell when I reach home. They're like, come home. Come back home. Then I didn't go back to Paris. I went back to Val, to Super Game, where my granny stays now. So when I reached by my granny... I was three months pregnant, so I started working, uh, going to the clinic for antenatal and stuff like that. So from there, um, I stayed, you know, because I was like 16 years old. I stayed, and my green was like, my aunt was like, okay, when you're done giving birth, we'll take care of the child. You go back to school because you're still young. You can go back to school. I was like, cool, why not? But I don't know if I can say there was voices or a thing that was calling in the street. I didn't want to see myself sitting in the house. Like, mm -mm, I didn't want, you know. So when I was four months pregnant, I remember it was December time. So, you know, as in our culture, we have that thing that we do, like fire cracks and stuff like that. So, but before that, because we had a dog in our yard. So I had to close the, the dog, the dog, you know, yes, in the, in the house of it and then do the fire cracks and stuff like that. And then, so I remember that time after 12, after doing the fire cricks and stuff like that, and I said to my green, I'm going to open for open the dog now to come out. My green was like, okay, cool. I jumped the fence. I ran after 12 midnight. So on the 1st of January of the new year. Of the new year of 2011. Your decision was, I'm running. I'm just like, no, the street is calling the boozing. Alcohol. They took my phone. I, you know, I'm like, nah, I'm leaving. I'll see myself, but wherever I want to come, I'm going. 
and it was raining heavy that day. Eh? It was heavy. It was raining, and I decided to jump the fence. The last time my granny saw me is the time I said I'm going to open the dog. That was the last time. I left. I arrived. There's a place called Chisanyama in zone 14 because I was in zone 13. Then in zone 14, there's a place called Chisanyama. It's a club day and stuff like that. So when I arrived there, there was this guy outside in a test. Like, why are you standing here in the rain alone and it's raining? Like, the guy's like, come in. Let's go to my place. Let me give you something to change and let's go to drink. Like, cool. Why not? We went... The guy borrowed me his trick suit, and then we went to the club, we drank, we drank. I went back, I slept with the guy. The volunteer gave me money, and then I went to Frenaging, back to the same place where I was prostituting myself. When I arrived there, my room was still secure, and some of my staff was still there. Are you not pregnant? Still? I'm still pregnant. Like, I'm four months pregnant. Yes, yes. Fine. It's January. On the 20th, uh, yeah, Feb, on the 26th, I started having, like, pains in my tummy but didn't understand what was going on at that moment people can't see that i'm pregnant because i was wearing things that are you know so yes and i was drinking a lot you know so on the 26th of feb 2011 i started feeling pains in my tummy but didn't understand what 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 was going on at that moment i continued sleeping around drinking you know all that things and then after that on the 28th I had a client that booked me for a whole night. So we're in the hotel. In the morning when I went, the pains were so severe that I couldn't walk. Like I didn't know what was going on, but I was in so much pain. The guy left, gave me the man. He left in the morning. I went to the bath. I bathed. I soaked myself in that water, but this pain didn't want to be easy. And I tried to walk. I think I was walking just like second, then I stopped. Second, and I stopped. And when I reached in the street... There was this guy passing. It's like, so what's going on? I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. It's like, okay, can we call the ambulance? I'm like, please. They tried to call the ambulance and we've waited and have waited and have waited. The ambulance didn't arrive at the moment. So next to that hotel where we was, there was Medi Clinic just next day. So the guy took me to the Medi Clinic. And then when I arrived there, they demanded the such huge money. I'm like, no, nah, I don't have. But I have money on my back. I'm like, well, I don't have such money. So I started bleeding. And then they gave me a purse to put in. And they're like, okay, let's call the ambulance. Then that time the ambulance arrived quickly. I went to hospital. When I arrived there, they examined me. They examined me. And then they said I had miscarriage. So they started injecting something in my trip. And they're like, okay. And I waited for about three hours before this thing comes out. And it was so much pains there. So while I was there waiting, and after the... Yeah, after the baby came out and stuff like there was a baby boy. So they asked me if I want to take a body or if someone is coming to fetch me and stuff like that. That moment I'm thinking, I left home without them knowing where I am and stuff like that. And if I call them now telling them, that, are they going to come? I'm like, I don't want to go home. Let me just do this myself. Let me handle it myself. At that time, they asked me how old I am. I said I'm 18, but at that time I'm 16. So I signed a consent form. That says they can bring the baby day. Slept there for three days. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. So this, yeah, they can bring them there. You sign the consent form. Or if you want to bury the baby, you take the baby. And then, yeah. So after that, I stayed there for three days. They cleaned me and stuff like that. And I went back to the hotel. Continued doing, oh, the same doctor was helping me. Two weeks later, I met him in the same central hotel where we were prostituting. He recognized me. I didn't even recognize him. It's like, And then he started being my client. They became my regular. So, yeah. And then after that, yeah, I stayed, continued doing the same thing. And then I fell pregnant again with my second child. After how long? I th- just maybe a year. Okay. Yes. And then after that... Um, so at this time, it was a bit different because the guy that I dated, he was the, he's the one that actually started, he was my client before we even like knowing who I was pregnant, stuff like that. He, he was my client, they became my regular and then became my boyfriend. Okay. Then he made me stop doing prostitution. He was taking care of me, took me to his place, stuff like that. And then uh, mom, you, her mom realized that I was pregnant. I didn't know even I was pregnant. She asked me, like, how far are you? I was like, hmm? It's like, how far are you? I'm like, not pregnant. 
So the following day we did pregnancy test and I found out I was pregnant. Now you're 17. Now I'm 17. So I tried to call home. My granny started insulting me, telling me, hey, don't want to hear anything about you. Oh. Hey, every time when you come back here, you, you bring pregnancy. Stuff like, you know, all the things. And I was like, oh, okay, it's okay. Then I stayed there at the boyfriend place. After a week, I think they called home. But the same was my aunt calling. She's like, hey, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Shakti. She's like, can you come uh, tomorrow morning home? I'm like, yeah, why not? Then I went home. Then we stayed. Then I told them, okay, yeah, the father of the child is there. I'm staying with him right now. Stuff like that. They're like, okay, you can come back home. So they wrote, because uh, Sipo was closer. So they wrote the letter that says the damage has been done, stuff like that. Then they went back to my place. And then things did the way their culture is doing things. So fine, I stayed home. I stayed home. I was doing good. I was doing good. Whereby I gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. Um, after giving birth, I think when my daughter was a year, my aunt decided to let me go back to school. But I didn't go to, I didn't want to go to uniform school. I, was, I felt like I'm old now for that, you know. You know, I'm like, uh -uh. I'm not going where to go. Because I dropped school at grade nine. And imagine I have to go wear uniform at the age of... People were eating are doing matric already. So I have to, I'm like, nah. So they said, what do you want to do? I said, no, I can go to a bed school. So there's this old school they call like, oh. yes. I went there. I was doing well, man. I was doing well. The father of my child was there. You know, everything was going smooth and nice. So um, when my daughter was nine months old, the dad disappeared. When the dad disappeared, I was shattered. Started drinking at school. Started lying, said I'm doing some project whereby we'll go around, drink, come back home late. I have to breastfeed. I, everything was just too much for me. So uh, I remember um, my aunt from, from Blomfontein was there. So she had a little boy who was about two years older than my, my daughter. So I lied to my aunt that day. I was like, no, man, we have project at school and I have to go this and this and this and this and this. We're writing about this. If I miss this out, you know, my aunt was like, you know what? I'll take the kids from to the mall. Just go and come back. Cool. I didn't come back. I went. I drank myself to death. I drank. I passed out wherever I was. And then after that, I woke up the following day and I'm like, it hit. Shit, I left the child. I have to go back home and stuff like that. Then I had that gut, you know. I went back. When I arrived there, my aunt, they were angry. They were, they were very angry. Sure. So my aunt decided that that time they're going to Bloemfontein. She's taking my granny with. I have to sort my things out. So they left me with the child alone. Say so this thing I'm running to. You know, now you see what's happening. Same thing that my mom was doing to me. Now it's following, going to me, because it's a bloodline case. Now I'm the one that abandoning my child, you know, not wanting to take responsibility, you know. So fine, I stayed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, I took the child to college, went to school. Get drunk after school, went home, stole my, my granny's money, didn't fetch the child from crash, went back to Central Hotel. Hey family, thank you so much for being loyal to Engineering Your Life. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably here for the second time or the third time. And please, if you're here for the second, third time, please may you kindly subscribe. Because if you subscribe, it helps us to get better conversation, get better guests, and get access to creating the best content that we can for you. So please don't forget to subscribe and make sure you continue watching this episode. Started meeting other Nigerians who was, because this guy was very old, so I never used to sleep with him. I, like, I never slept with him. He, I think I was about 20, 21, something. Yes. So after that then, this guy was old. His name, they used to call him Baba Nugu. So he was so old, so I, I didn't have interest to sleep with him. I, I didn't want to. So me and him, it was business, just like that. He buys me food, clothes, hair. I make money. He gives me drugs. That's all, you know. So I met these other small Nigerians that were charming and, you know, just because now I'm so used to that thing. Now I'm jumping to other Nigerians to the next one, you know. I stayed with this one. His name was Casey. He started beating me. 
I went back to Ucha again. And then I met this other one. They call him Escape. So I stayed with Escape, not knowing that now I was taking myself to a pit of hell. Because Escape was so abusive. When I mean abusive, I mean emotionally, physically, mentally. That guy was so abusive. I've got scars on my body. That God is story of everything that the guy did to me, you know. So I stayed with this guy. When I stayed with him, um, I couldn't left. Like, I couldn't leave him anymore. I don't know why. I couldn't leave. At that moment, I didn't understand why because I was that kind of person that when you start beating me, I leave. I don't want someone to touch me, so I leave. But this one, it was so difficult. It was so, not knowing the guy was using juju on me, which is the kolmuti, you know? So I stayed with the guy almost five to six years. I was with this guy, whereby he would hit me, abuse me, but I would still be there, you know? And it came to a point where he brainwashed me so much that he will like he will beat me and he will come and say, You see what you make me to do. You understand? So it came to the point where like I started believing oh, I'm the one provoking him to beat me. I mean though it was not like that. You understand? This guy stepped me, this guy bent me, this guy killed my child, whereby he took me to do a potion without me knowing because I was so high on drugs. He said that it's taking me to the doctor to, to check up. Not knowing how it, Oh, so sad. Don't, don't take your time. Not knowing that he was taking me to go do abortion. So I remember this day, it was 2014 or 15. So we, I think it was 2014 or 15. So I was with a smoking client whereby we smoked for a week. I haven't slept for a week. Mm. So this guy decided to leave Monday morning. So when this guy left Monday morning, um, I was about to take a bath and like, okay, finish the bath. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Let me smoke weed and rest because weed, I could like calm down a bit from drugs. So he's like, no, don't smoke weed now. Take these stones. He gave me about six stones to smoke of drugs. It's like, no, I just want to take you to the doctor quickly for checkup, you know? Because he knows that he made me pregnant. You understand? I was about four months pregnant at that time. So he took me to the um, abortion clinic. That time, you know, when you are high and stuff, just things you don't just put in mind. You just go with the flow. We arrived there. He was busy talking to these girls alone on the side, not knowing what's going on. So we arrived there. They did sauna. And then he paid the money. And then remember, they they took me to this room. They gave me two tablets. I said, I must put it under my tongue. Then I must wait there. So I sat there. But then now the drugs start coming out on my system. Now my mind is like, it's coming back, you know. Then there was this lady sitting next to me. I'm like, what's happening here? You know, where's the doctor? Like, I've been sitting here waiting for this doctor. This lady is like, nah, this is abortion clinic. At that time, it was late already because the tablets is killing the baby inside, mm. you know. So... I sat there and I was like, what? Like, I became cold. My whole body froze. I became so cold. Instead of crying, I couldn't cry. It was so difficult. I sat there and I started feeling pains. They took me to this other room where, like, there's a stretch bed. You just sit there, open your legs. They tie your legs there. And then there's this sharp mental thing, like screwdriver that's, like, Mm. you know, going down on your vagina go straight to the womb, and then that thing when it comes, because there's a screen that is there next to you that you can see, when that mental enter your womb, like, open up, like, and it's like things like razors, where it cuts the baby, chops the baby like a mince, chops the baby, chops the baby, and then after that, when that thing is done, it closes again, and it comes out. When it comes out, then those pieces of a child and stuff already come out. Mm-hmm. That's what I experienced. But okay, thank God he's with Jesus now. So after that, he came and fetched me back, and then we went back to the place. He fed me drugs. He fed me drugs. He, I became numb. I became numb to the point that I've never cried. It took me a year and six months before I cried. Mm. 
I became numb to the point where I built that this wall that I will never cry again in my life. That was like how numb I was. After that, I stayed in the house, I think, for a week to recover and stuff like that. Started smoking drugs. I lost a lot of weight because of stress now and not eating and all the like. I became so thin. This time I was so bad, you know. Um, after that, uh, I continued. I gained, started gaining weight again. Continued living there, doing the same thing again. And then he will beat me. I've got a scar on my back where he stabbed me with a full glass. I didn't cry. He bent me here on my hand with hot water and dead hole, whereby he tied me with a, a belt. You know this stretchy belt? Yes. So he tied me with that belt, and then he poured hot water and poured dead hole. So when he removed that belt, it came out with my skin. This was very bad. So this side, I don't know where it went, just disappeared. And then... He almost took my eye out. I've got a sky here where he bit me with the, the what you call, this, the belt thing on my eye. Um, He raped me where he tried to rape me on my anal. He even put a screwdriver on my anal trying to, I don't know what he was doing, but mm. yes. Um, yeah, he did so many things whereby he would, like, so he used to have this thing also when he's beating you, he will take chili. There's this orange chili that Nigerians, they love. He will crush that chili and then he closes, he, cl he closes your eyes with it. Like he wrapped it on your eyes and then he wrapped it on your vagina. I don't know, that was his kind of way punishing you or something. And then he make you go and bath with cold water. So imagine the pain that is there. So this one time when he closes this eye, he wrapped the chili as well. So he thought that I couldn't see what he was doing. So I saw him with this small bottle with red ribbons whereby, because I was bleeding, he took my blood with that mm. um, small bottles that he was using. So I left. Oh, I remember that the fight became too much, me and him. So I left him. I went to stay with Anna Nigerian. So when I went and stayed with Anna Nigerian, he started disturbing me on the street. It's like, I'm not going to stay with any Nigerian while he's still here in Pretoria. But I'm like to him, you're not the one who brought me in Pretoria. So you're not going to tell me what to do with my life. This is my life. Whoever I want to stay with, I will choose who I'm going to stay with. You're not going to tell me what to do. It's like, okay, try it. Try to bump me with the car in the street. Every time when he saw me with the client, he disturbs me and stuff like that. And then he took me. He said, okay, you know what? Go to rehab. Go and rest. You will come back. So I went to the rehab. Um, that was my first time trying to go to rehab, change my life. So there was this lady, there's this lady they call Mama V, Vilna Badi. So she, she's a pastor. She helps the girls in the street. So she used to walk before, oh, wait, wait, I'm too forward. Before that, so Mama V met me in the street while I left escape. I was with this other Nigerian guy. So when Mama V left me in the street, she like, when she met me in the street, she's like, I want to talk to you. I want to help you. Yeah. And then I will insult her in that moment, you know. This white people coming and disturbing me, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I was insulted, telling you that, who said I want help? I don't want help. I'm okay and stuff like that. She's like, no, Jesus wants me to help you. Mm -hmm. And I will be saying to her, no, tell Jesus me I don't want help. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Who is Jesus? I don't know that person, mm -hmm. you know. And then after that, she will, like, she she never gave up. She still, she still came and came. So she will, like, give us makeup, things to bath. At winter, they bring such, like, uh, okay. polar fleas, yeah. yes, some scarves and soup and stuff like that, you know. She used to take care of the girls at the street. So I remember there was this girl I was staying with her in that place. She was sick. So I said to her, so I saw her on the street and I'm like, okay, you said you want someone to help. I don't want help, but there's someone you can help. Mm -hmm. She's like, okay, who's that? I'm like, I've got a friend in the house that is sick, so you can help her. So they came in, they took Mpo. Her name was Mpo. They took her. Mama V wasn't staying far from where the girls was working in that territory. She was staying, I think, just, let's say, two, two minutes walk from where we were, you know. She had a house there in Beckett Street. So she took Mpo. They left. Fine. A week passed. And then I had a fight with this Nigerian guy. And at this time, I became so evil as well. So I started showing the cops where they put in the drugs. So not me knowing how dangerous they are. After doing that, then I decided to go to Mama V by myself. 
So I went there, I walked, go went there, and then she opened for me. And then I stayed there, I think, for a week or two weeks. So then when this thing was calling, excuse me, this heart or whatever voice I was hearing, it was calling. Then I went back to the street again. When I arrived there, same thing, went back to escape again, still getting the abuse and stuff like that. Then I went to the second rehab. This time I struggled with cycle of three months, breaking that three-month cycle. I'll be then rehab for three months. After three months, I want to leave. I want to leave. I'll fight. I'll jump electric fence. I'll jump. However, how high the gate is, I'll jump it if I want to leave at that moment. So I left, went back to escape. The abuse, whatever, drugs and stuff like that. Go back again. Yeah. And then... um. Oh, I felt pregnant again with the escaped child again. And can I have water? Sure. So I felt pregnant again <clears throat> after it. But this time I stayed with that pregnancy for the whole nine months in the street. Drinking, smoking, prostituting, all of that. Getting bitten by clients almost get killed, you know, it was difficult. So um, I went back to Mama V. When I arrived there, she couldn't help me because she was renovating where she was staying. Now she moved from that place, she was going to another place. So she found a place for me. <clears throat> I gave birth to a baby boy. At that moment, I couldn't handle the crying and it was too much for me and I was sick myself. So. Everything was just too much. So there was this lady that is, um, I don't know what's going on with my face now. So there was this lady that, where I was staying in the, in, in the rehab, they knew this lady who was owning a safe house for the kids. So this lady, she used to come there bring like baby's clothes, nappies and stuff like that. So they called there, they like, can you take care of this child for until Emma it's okay, yeah. you know? Yeah. She's like, okay, you guys can bring her. So we drove, went to Montana. When we arrived there, um, she's like, no. <coughs> when we arrived there, she's like, no, um, I'm not going to take care to the baby house. I will take care of her. Like, she fell in love with my son. So she's like, okay, go to the police station, do affidavit for me that says that uh, you're putting blessing under my care, sure. you know? So we did that, and we took it back to her, and then we went back to the safe house. So blessing will visit me, like, every weekend or every two weeks, you know? So, yeah, I stayed. This time it was different because, oh, after blessing left, I ran away for about, like, two weeks. After that, I went back to the safe house again. After that, this time it was different. I stayed for about 11 months. Okay. Like, I break that cycle, you know? Mm. I stayed for 11 months. I stayed, I was doing well. Then I don't know what happened. Boom, again, went back to the street again. Went back to the street, went back to escape again. They had escaped, I started drinking, and then I left him. I went to this other Nigerian guy in Bosbeck. Then I was staying in Bosbeck. So there in Bosbeck, I started drinking a lot, started doing a lot of shit a lot, like stealing from clients. Phones, laptops, money, wallets, like started doing a lot of like rubbish there. So I remember then I met this client. He was driving a red golf. When I met this client, it's like, um, how much? I'm like, this much. It's like, okay, let's go. We went. So the guy where he was staying, it's like it was like a police complex, sort of something like that. Because when we arrived there, we packed and we went to the second floor. And when we arrived there, in his room, there was this, um, the, yes, there was this still double bait. Okay. And in the, on the fridge, there was this, his photo with, like, uniform, police uniform. And there was a police uniform that is hanging there, you know. <clears throat> and then I was like, oh, it's a cop. So the guy gave me the money. So I had a side bag with, like, sort of a jacket and a dress and just shoes, you know. So I just took out the painty out, took out the jacket and just put the stuff the and left the dress and just pull it up so the guy we did like the first 
style. And then when he asked for dog, he started, he started choking me. I thought he was joking, you know, like he started struggling me in the back, you know. So I thought he was joking. I'm like, you're choking me, bruh. He's like, yeah, die, bitch. That was the last word that I heard. Then when I woke up, I was lying on the street. Where I was lying on the street, like it was a road and then there was like a grass, a high grass, like. So the guy strangled me to the point where I felt unconscious. So he thought that I was dead and he threw me out in the street. So when I woke up, I don't even know how long I was lying there. I can't tell. So when I was lying there, as I opened my eyes, like started like feeling water and stuff like that. And as I was wiping, there was blood coming out on my face. So as I look on my side, then I saw like a light coming on my left side. So as I tried to stand up, I couldn't stand up. Then I crawled to the road. This guy, it was ADT car. The guy stopped. And as he stopped, he asked if I'm okay. Then as I was trying to respond, started coughing blood. The guy left. And I'm in my heart. Okay, I grew up in a, in a Christian house. So I used to pray. You know, even though I was in the street, I used to pray, you know. So when the guy left, I'm like, God, he's leaving me, you know. Not even in a second, the guy came back. It was him, a police car. And then there was an ambulance coming on the way, but it didn't arrive immediately with them. So when they arrived, they tried to stand me up. I couldn't stand up. I was so weak. So I had internal bleeding. So I was so weak where I was bleeding my ears, my eyes, my nose, and my mouth. So the ambulance arrived. They took me to the hospital. I passed out in the ambulance. So they didn't open the file yet. I think I was there for two weeks in ICU. According to what the, the medical saying, I was lying there for two weeks in ICU. No one knows where I was. So when I woke up there, like, I was okay. Everything just, it was just a miracle because even the doctor said, like, I haven't seen the kids like this. You know, this was a miracle. So they started filing, but then they wanted to call a social worker for me because they found when they ran the blood tests and stuff like that, they found some cocaine on my blood. So they started, you know, wanting to ask questions. In my mind, escape is calling. I want to leave. I'm like to them, no, I'm okay. I don't need social worker. There's nothing wrong with me. Just want to go home. They discharged me. I called escape. He came and fished me. From Pretoria to Bosbeck, he came and fished me. I went back and then we fought me and escaped. And I went back to Bosbeck again. And then there it was back. Um, I stayed and then I fell pregnant. When I fell pregnant again, this Nigerian, okay, that time when I was still there, escape got arrested, you know. But in my mind, I was like, ah, he's going to pay them money as he usually, you know, give the cops money and then they just leave, you know. Because I hate cops. I don't want to lie. I hate them because they couldn't protect us. They just saw us as prostitutes, so they didn't care about us, you know, more especially Sunnyside cops, because they used to take a lot of pride from Nigerians. You will come there bleeding to death, show them what the Nigerian did to you. They take them for almost 10 minutes, 20 minutes, the guy's out, you know. So after that, we came back, okay, um, where was I? Uh, after that, um, I was pregnant, sitting there. And then escape was arrested. I was in my mind, I was like, oh, he's coming out. You know, it's not a big deal. You know, fine. And Mecca was going to Nigeria at that time. So I had to go home. So me knowing I can't go home because of pregnancy and stuff like that. I had to make plans and see what can I do. So I called Mama V. I went back to Mama V. But before I went back to Mama V, Mama V told Emeka, because before I tried to go home, a... Uh, Mama V told Emeka that if he's ready to give me to God, we can call him. Okay. That was her weight. So that night, Emeka called Mama V. It's like, I'm ready to give Emma to God. Then he drove to bus back to Pretoria. We met Mama V at Sunnyside um, McDonald's. He picked me up there. She picked me up there, and then we went to her place. She was staying in Freight Lane that time. When we arrived in Freight Lane, um, I stayed. I stayed, so Mama V had this um, thing of that when you arrive, you, you have a bag of clothes and stuff like that. She doesn't take things from the street. Even the ones that you're wearing, you must take them out. It's things from the street, you know. When you come with braids, they cut your braids, 
you, you know, it's up to you if you really want help, you know. So I had a big bag of clothes that time when I arrived. Took out my clothes and stuff like that. And then I stayed. I stayed. I was three months pregnant. And then I remember rushing, telling Mama V, I really want to bend this clothes. And that day, it was like almost going to rain. I asked God, please let, please not now. Let me finish to do what I want to do. I bent those clothes. After that, there was like this big wind and, you know, rain that came, you know. Fine. After that, I stayed. Then I was busy praying, asking God to um, send someone who can come and adopt this child because I didn't want a child. Like, Nigerian child, not that I hate my kids. Both two of my boys are Nigerians. It's just that they've got that lot of, like, resemblance from their dad, you know. I think because I'm still on the chain of healing, it's not easy for me now to be with them, you understand? So... Um, while I was still there, my mama be praying for that. Lizelle, the same lady that took my child a, two years ago, she was already going on with adoption things because as an abandoned child, because I left, she didn't know where I was. I didn't contact and stuff like that. So when she found out that I was my mama be and I'm looking for someone to adopt my son as well, she was like, I want that child. I want that child as well. So she came, we started working the journey together going to saunas and stuff like that until I get bed. She took this, the, uh, his name is Ethan. She took Ethan. Both of my boys now growing up there. There are two of them there. She's taking good care of them. They're speaking Africans and English. Uh, Blessing is six. Ethan is four years old. So after that, I stayed by Mama V. I started having this relationship with God, yeah. like Jesus. Started opening up. It took me, I, I struggled with psychosomatic event that took a, a year and six months. So my body basically started reacting because of the trauma and the beatings that I experienced a lot. My body started reacting by itself, like every month, because where my escape used to beat me every month, struggling me, closing my eyes as I talk about chili, my body will pain. So my body started reacting from that every month. My body started, my eyes started swallowing up. My throat started paining my body and stuff like that. So I started going for counseling whereby I had to start speaking to my body, tell it that we safe now, you're not in danger anymore. I think it took me for six months before it, my body started relaxing and knowing that it's not in the danger anymore. Fine, I stayed rehab and then I started like breaking those walls, started crying, Pray. praying, Connecting with God, the Holy Spirit, you know, and then worshiping. I love to sing, so I started worshiping. Yeah, everything became okay. Like I started feeling like I'm normal, you know. Um, and then after that, I stayed up by Mama V. I think for two or three years. Or so, <clears throat> so at that time, Mama V wanted us to heal completely, but wanting to do something with my life, you know, it's like wanting to go back to school, wanting to do something, start like, you know, having something that is going to equip me, you know. So I moved to Mama V. I went to Brave Home by Emma van der Waals. Went to stay with Emma. I started doing my grade school, my school, started my grade 10, doing my grade 11, now I'm finishing my matric, you know. And I was doing well. I thought well, after drugs and all the abuse and stuff like that, like, you know, do you do you um, uh, uh, for the interest because we need to conclude our, our conversation? Do you believe that all of that restoration would have not been possible without God? Do you believe Emma, Liesel, Brave House were all vessels of God? Yes, I do believe that because they were God sent. Because yeah. before I left Bosbeck, before my my pim called Mama V, yeah. that night, I mean the night before. I was actually, I didn't want to smoke. I don't know why. When I smoked drugs, they came back. Mm. When I, I drank alcohol, it came back. Feel, didn't feel to sleep with clients. Like, I didn't want anything. And I remember that night, I stand in the street, when I started worshipping. I don't know why, but my spirit started connecting with God. I started worshipping, and I started telling him that, you know what, I know you are alive. But if you are, because I've See, never experienced it, yes, take me out of this. And instead, in that moment, I experienced the presence of God. It was so tangible. I've never felt something like that in my entire life. After that, from there, the following day I left and I've never looked back. 
On the 20th of October now, I'm five years clean from drugs. Never went back, never looked back. Last year I was testifying, my pimp is arrested, escape is arrested. He's been there, he was arrested since 2019. He's been there now, trial, he's been trial because after I stood up and I became a voice because a lot of girls were scared to go and testify, you know. Cops found few of us, and when they try to gather the information, the girls will give the information. But when it's time to go and testify, yo, I can't remember. No, this and this and that. And then when I went to Emma, because Emma and Uncle Byron, they work with such crimes, like going out there, arresting, they're working with hawks, basically. So when Emma asked me, are you ready because you've been with Escape for so long? Do you want to testify? I'm like, yes, why not? Because if I don't stop him, He's going to continue doing this to the other girls. You understand? So I testified last year, August. And I, you know, funny part, I remember before I testified on the 8th of August, there was a moment the time Escape was beating me. As I told it, like I stopped crying. When Escape was beating me, I remember looking at him in the eyes and it's like, don't look at me. Then I continued looking at it, it kicked on my face. And I just turned, I said to him, your day is coming. But at that moment, I didn't know what I was talking about, honestly. I didn't know. So on the 8th of August last year, when I was in court testifying, because we were testifying like in a room, then they were in court. They didn't want us to be because they were going to intimidate us. You know how they are. So I remember while I was sitting there, I remember the Holy Spirit clearly saying to me, this is the day you were talking about. I just want you to know that right now you're a testimony that God fully restores. Thank you. Uh, the old is gone. Yes. The old is not your identity. Mm -hmm. It's something that you went through. Yes. There are mistakes that you've made and I'm glad you've taken accountability that some of the mistakes you made yourself, yes, you didn't yes. look at yourself as a victim completely yes, of other yes. people's doings, but a lot of it, you took decisions as an adult to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. I hope you've forgiven yourself the same way God has forgiven you. Um, I hope you tell other people how God doesn't only pick those who are doing right in life, mm -hmm. but he goes into your pit and fetches you. Exactly. Because God loves all of us, all of us regardless yes. of who you think you are. Yes. There is no way you can earn your love from God. Yes. God is insistent in our lives and God is faithful regardless of who we are. So I thank you so much for sharing a story with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability and, and complete, continue trusting God. Yeah. You're a light that has showed me how much it is possible when we trust God. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Introducing the epitome of luxury living, Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. This villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor-to-ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.